these come from our students. Uh, and in this case, uh, all credit for the initiative of bringing Dr. Andrew Roberts to, uh, to UT goes to one of our star undergrads in the history department, Chance Cooley. Um, and you'll be hearing from him in, in just, just, just a moment. Um, but for me, it's a, a personal pleasure to be um, uh, uh, helping put this on because uh, so many of the themes of today's talk resonate with a lot of the themes of the Clement, Clement Center's intellectual mission about drawing on historical insights for some of the current uh, policy challenges facing our country and our world today. Um, and certainly when you look at our trouble of geopolitics, it does seem like a uh, Churchillian moment, uh, you might say. So, um, And uh, also one of the things that the Clement Center does is run a uh, May Master in, in London every May and June for, uh, for 20 fortunate UT undergrads. And uh, Andrew has been a guest speaker to that many times over and is always one of our, our, our favorite ones there. So, uh, But to formally introduce our, our speaker for today, I would like to bring up Chance Cooley and he will do the introduction. So please join me. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Harry Ransom Center. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank a couple people who are instrumental in making this happen. Uh, Professor Forgey, if you would stand up and just stand up as I uh, call your name. Uh, I took Professor Forgey's class, and he was sort of a uh, Dr. Jackson Jones, who's head of the history department here. Dr. Coffin, I took her French Revolution Napoleon class, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Ann Bowden in the Clement Center, of course. And last person, uh, certainly not least, uh, I don't know where he is, but Michael Johnson uh, has put all the work in, advertising, everything, oh, there he is. So give him a round of applause. Andrew Roberts is a distinguished historian and visiting professor at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. He is a visiting research fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a distinguished fellow at the New York Historical Society. You might know him from popular bestsellers like The Storm of War, which was a new and original take on World War II, or Masters and Commanders about the different leaders who shaped the West during and after the Second World War. I first became familiar with uh, Dr. Robert's work after reading Napoleon, A Life, an all-encompassing biography of the French Emperor. His biography has spent many weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list and if you haven't gotten the book, I highly recommend it. But you don't have to take my word for it. He'll be speaking on Winston Churchill, the subject of his new biography, Churchill Walking with Destiny, in eight major newspapers, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, the Sunday Times, and Sunday Telegraph have all called his biography of Churchill unarguably the best biography of Winston Churchill ever written. Given that there's over a thousand biographies of Winston Churchill in circulation, we are extremely lucky to have him here speaking with us today. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Roberts. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chance, for those very uh, kind words. When you invited me here, I didn't expect that this was going to be the beginning of something that snowballed now into a five-week um, book tour that's taken me to five states and, as my wife points out, um, has meant that I'm not going to see her for the longest period of time since our marriage began. Um, she, she, uh, she doesn't, she's not as impressed with you as, as I am. Um, I'd like to take you back to the day, the uh, 10th of May, 1940, Friday the 10th of May, the evening of that day, which was when Adolf Hitler, um, on the morning of that day, Adolf Hitler unleashed Blitzkrieg on the West, invading Luxembourg, um, Holland, and Belgium, and very soon afterwards, of course, he also entered France. It was on that evening that the King, King George VI, appointed Winston Churchill to be uh, Prime Minister. And Churchill wrote of that, uh, in, in his war memoirs eight years later, he wrote of that day, I felt as if I were walking with destiny, and that all my past life had been but a preparation for that hour and for that trial. And what I try to do in this, uh, in this book, Walking with Destiny, is to examine that, to unpack it slightly, investigate the extent to which that's true, the various jobs that he had, the various experiences he had in his life, uh, the ministries, such as the Ministry of Munitions, in which he employed two and a half million people in the First World War, or the First Lord of the Admiralty in charge of the Royal Navy in both the First World War and the Second World War, um, or Home Secretary or Chancellor of the Exchequer, the way in which his experience really did prepare him 
for the um, hour of becoming Prime Minister. But I also look at the beginning part of that sentence, the bit about walking with destiny, because I think it's absolutely essential in trying to understand the drive of Winston Churchill, the thing that made him tick, to appreciate that he believed that he was indeed a child of destiny. When he was an actual child, when he was 16 years old, he told his friend uh, at Harrow School uh, in, uh, in London um, that there were gonna be terrible upheavals and, and great struggles in the world, and that at some stage, Britain was going to uh, be under the threat of invasion, and that he would be called upon to save London and save England. And um, it must have been perfectly reasonable to have uh, laughed at him when a 16-year-old uh, boy makes that kind of um, observation. But then half a century later, exactly that happened. He was, um, he was really um, strengthened in this sense of his own private destiny by the extraordinary number of close brushes he had with death. Um, he had already, by that time, um, uh, survived childbirth, which uh, he was two months um, premature, and in late Victorian England, um, that itself was, a, uh, was an achievement. He'd been stabbed in the stomach uh, at the age of 10 um, by a, a, a school friend. Clearly not a very close uh, sort of <laughs> um, He had suffered from pneumonia, something that very nearly killed him at the age of 11. And on that occasion, the doctors administered brandy to the 11-year-old, um, both orally and rectally, um, which you would have thought would put you off brandy for life, but in Winston Churchill's case, it certainly didn't. <laughs> he was involved uh, in a... Um, uh, an accident on Lake Geneva that nearly drowned him. He was involved in a, in a uh, house fire where uh, the wing of the house started burning down at three o'clock in the morning when he was asleep upstairs and he managed to survive that as well. He was involved in two plane crashes, uh, three car crashes. And um, on the front of, the, of my book, this magnificent um, Karsh photo, um, taken in 1941, you can see down the centre of his forehead a huge gash that came as a result of his being uh, run over by a car on uh, Fifth Avenue and 76th Street in New York. Being an Englishman, he looked in the wrong way and uh, stepped out into the street and was, uh, and was, uh, was very nearly killed. Um, and those were only peacetime moments when he uh, nearly died. In the, and, that, and that's only a, a, a brief summary of them as well. There are plenty more. In wartime, he took part in uh, five campaigns on four continents, uh, three of them between the ages of 21 and 25. He took part in the last great cavalry charge of the British Empire, the Battle of Omdurman, he, um, where he killed four dervishes. He uh, was ambushed in the South African War uh, by uh, a Boer commando that uh, attacked his uh, armoured train and uh, knocked it off the tracks, and he was captured. 34% um, of his unit were killed or wounded in that action, just as 25% had been killed or wounded in the, in the charge at Omdurman. He um, then went to, into a prisoner of war camp and two months later escaped. Um, and crossed 300 miles of enemy territory um, before getting to, uh, to, to British uh, territory. He, in the First World War, went into no man's land uh, when he was Lieutenant Colonel of the 6th Battalion of the Royal Scots Fusiliers, no fewer than 30 times, uh, getting so close to the German trenches that he could actually hear them speaking uh, in the trenches. So this is a man, uh, ladies and gentlemen, who believed, as he put it uh, on one occasion, an extraordinary occasion actually in the First World War, where he left his dugout on the front uh, line of, um, of uh, where his regiment was, um, was based at um, uh, Klugstert in, uh, in Belgium, which of course his troops called Klug Street. And he, um, he, he left the dugout, and five minutes after he left it, a German whiz-bang high explosive hit the, um, the dugout in a direct hit and decapitated everybody inside. And on that occasion, he said that he felt as if invisible wings were beating over him. Um, wings, of course, of uh, some uh, higher being that he believed was saving him 
uh, to save uh, to save London, save uh, and save England at some future date. Um, he wasn't a Christian. Uh, it wasn't uh, the saviour who was uh, who was saving him. In the 5.2 million words he wrote and the 6.1 million words he spoke, he never said the word Jesus Christ. However, he did believe in some form of an Almighty, who, when you look at it theologically, uh, really his his primary duty was to look after Winston Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that the one of the um, things that happened as a result of this uh, certainty of his that he was going to save, uh, save London and save the nation, was that in the Second World War, when he was Prime Minister, he uh, remained extraordinarily calm under, um, under crises, the worst crises, really, that my country has uh, ever known in its, uh, in its long history. He was able to make jokes, um, which uh, helped the morale of those around him. He would joke in Parliament. In one of the confidence motions in the House of Commons, where theoretically he could have, his entire government could have fallen, he um, he joked about the A22 tank, which was uh, admittedly a completely useless tank, and uh, he'd been criticised over it. And he said, when the um, defects and the teething troubles of the A22 tank became apparent to all, it was appropriately rechristened the Churchill. Um, and, uh, and the important word in that gag is appropriately, because Winston Churchill knew, he understood that he himself also had defects and teething troubles. He had got so many things wrong in his career. Again and again he had made blunders. He had got um, women's suffrage wrong. He had got the um, gold standard wrong, taking us in at the wrong time, at the wrong um, level. He had got the abdication crisis wrong, supporting King Edward VIII um, in instead of King George VI. He had got the Dardanelles crisis uh, completely wrong. It was a brilliant idea, it was a genius concept, to try to get the uh, Royal Navy through the Dardanelles Straits and to moor it off, um, off Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, and uh, therefore um, to be able to effectively knock the Ottoman Empire out of the First World War, take the Turks out of the, of the whole Great War. It would have been a moment of genius uh, if it had, uh, indeed in the history of war, it would have been up there as one of the great coups. But the actual, and this was Churchill's idea, but it was actually in the implementation of this uh, great idea that everything went wrong. And on the 18th of March, 1915, uh, Churchill, the, um, went to, Churchill was back in London, of course, but in the Straits. Uh, we lost six Allied ships um, trying to, uh, to get through the Straits. And then, instead of calling the whole thing off, Churchill was the primary driver, not the only, by any means. The rest of the War Council went along with it. But he was the, uh, the most uh, prominent pe people to say that we needed to land on the Gallipoli Peninsula, on the European side of the Straits, and, uh, and that resulted in an attack on the 25th of April 1915, which also got nowhere. And over the next six months, the fighting was just as bad as, uh, and, and blocked as anything that happened in the, um, in the uh, Western Front. And uh, ultimately, we lost 147,000 killed or wounded in that campaign. And of course, the, uh, it, was, it was held against Churchill. Uh, people, even up until the 1930s, People would shout, "What about the Dardanelles?" at him. Uh, hecklers would, uh, would would bring up the uh, the subject. So you have, therefore, uh, someone who makes mistakes, but who learns from them. In all of these mistakes that Churchill made, he learned something from them. With regard to the Dardanelles, he never once overruled the chiefs of staff in the Second World War. He was able to uh, to understand, to listen, to um, uh, to interact with them uh, very much, and sometimes they would uh, be very hard-fought arguments. Um, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, Sir Alan Brooke, later Lord Alan Brooke, would sit across the uh, cabinet table from the Prime Minister, breaking pencils in half, saying, no, I disagree with you, Prime Minister. Crack. Um, and, um, and yet, Churchill never overruled them. He had every constitutional right to if he wanted to. He was Minister of Defence as well as uh, Prime Minister. But he decided that, um, that he wasn't going to. And uh, so as a result, the grand strategy that was adopted by the British Chiefs of Staff, the strategy of um, 
of attacking in North Africa, and finally when the North African campaign was won in May 1943, then to cross over into Sicily in the July of 43, cross over after that into the foot of Italy in, um, in uh, September 1943, and then going finally across the Channel in June 1944. <coughs> that great strategy, which um, of course was then sold to the Americans and, uh, and George Marshall and the, and the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, was one that Winston Churchill and Alan Brooke came to together as a result of extremely hard-fought arguments. And the arguments also went on, of course, um, within the combined Chiefs of Staff uh, with the Americans. You'd have George Marshall slamming his fist down on the, uh, on the table um, uh, in uh, attacking um, Ernest, Admiral Ernest King's uh, desire to have a, a Pacific-based war rather than a, a Germany-first policy. So in all of these great debates, uh, debates in which the lives of tens of thousands of men hung upon the outcome, um, Churchill was, um, was highly provoked at times, but never once overruled the uh, Chiefs of Staff. I'm often asked why, uh, since, as has been pointed out, there are 1,009 biographies of Winston Churchill, that I should possibly be so hubristic as to uh, impose a 1,010th on, um, on the public. And the answer is that in the last 10 years, there has been an avalanche of new sources that have, um, have been made available about, uh, about Winston Churchill. I was very fortunate to, that uh, Her Majesty the Queen allowed me to be the first Churchill biographer to use her father, King George VI's diaries. And he met Churchill every Tuesday of the Second World War. Uh, they, had, um, they had lunch together and uh, they would serve themselves from the sideboard because nobody else could be present because Churchill trusted the king with all of the great secrets of the war. He told him about the nuclear secret, he told him about the ultra decrypts, he told him about where um, the uh, Allies were going to attack and when and under what circumstances. He told him with which generals and ministers he was going to hire and fire. Now, it didn't need to be, or it, it wasn't necessarily going to be a good relationship between Churchill and the King. Um, Churchill, in fact, the King has said earlier to the um, Canadian Prime Minister in 1939 that it would take a world war for him to appoint Churchill as Prime Minister. He didn't trust Churchill's judgment. He, like much of the rest of the British establishment, thought that he lacked judgment. And for him, the point at which he had, Churchill had supported his elder brother, King Edward VIII, during the abdication crisis, uh, merely underlined this, uh, this lack of respect for Churchill's judgment. Similarly, Churchill, of course, um, didn't approve of the way that the King had uh, supported so strongly Neville Chamberlain and the policy of appeasement. So they might not have gone on with one another, but they very quickly did. Indeed, by the time of the fall of France and the Battle of Britain, and certainly by the Blitz, um, they became what uh, the King refers to in his diaries as friends. In fact, he was the only one of the King's four prime ministers uh, to whom he referred by his Christian name. So that is one great source. Another are the 41 sets of papers that have been deposited at Churchill College Archives in Cambridge since the, um, since the last major biography of, uh, of Winston Churchill, including the, bi the diaries of Churchill's daughter, Mary Soames, um, which, uh, which have also proved invaluable for this book. Um, we have had in the last four years the publication of the diaries of Ivan Maisky, the Soviet ambassador from 1932 to 43, who saw an awful lot of Churchill in the um, period of the Nazi-Soviet pact. We've got something that I discovered uh, six years ago, the verbatim accounts of the war cabinet. Um, it turned out that the, uh, that the stenographer from the war cabinet, who took down everything that everyone, each individual said in those uh, meetings, um, did not burn his notes in the grate of the cabinet office, which is what he was supposed to have done under the Official Secrets Act 1911, but instead took them home um, and, uh, and then kept them until 1973 uh, when he died and they were given to, um, to the archives. And, um, and because they were all in hieroglyphics and, and uh, shorthand, nobody bothered to, uh, to look at them until one 
uh, wet Friday evening when I was uh, when my I was um, decided I wouldn't take an earlier train and instead take a later one, and purely by chance came across the. I'd love to pretend it was archival genius, but it wasn't. It was pure serendipity. Um, came across these um, these uh, verbatim accounts, and we've also on top of all of that, uh, we also have the. Um, I was very fortunate to be given exclusive access by the Churchill family to uh, Pamela Harriman's love letters. Um, Pamela Harriman, who was uh, Randolph Churchill, Winston Churchill's son, Randolph's um, wife during the Second World War, um, led a very uh, active romantic life, um, very active indeed. And, uh, and she um, had, uh, had her, her lovers wrote to her and often wrote about Churchill. And she uh, used to actually stay in the cabinet war rooms um, and sharing a bunk bed with Churchill, uh, she on the bottom, uh, because Clementine refused to sleep with him because he snored so much. Um, so we have a, uh, a, a whole set of new papers uh, which have come out in the last seven or eight or sometimes 10 years. And they together form an absolute cornucopia of new sources to the point that there's something on pretty much every page of this book that will never have appeared in any Churchill biography before. And what they tell us is that Churchill was a profoundly emotional man. He was driven by his passions far more than other politicians uh, of his age and class and background. He was, um, he was prone to bursting into tears. He, did the, he, he started crying on no fewer than 50 occasions during the Second World War. Um, it must be very off-putting to, uh, to have a Prime Minister. I sometimes wonder if Theresa May, who has every right, by the way, to burst into tears, <laughs> um, uh, were to uh, burst into tears in the, uh, in the House of Commons, uh, what, uh, what on earth people would, uh, would make of that. Churchill did it 50 times. And he, they weren't ever so, tears of self-pity. They were tears of, of pride sometimes, emotion, sadness. Um, they were... Um, part of that blood, toil, tears and sweat that, uh, that he had uh, promised the British people on the 13th of May 1940, but they were also evidence of him being uh, profoundly driven by his emotions because he was not the buttoned up Victorian aristocrat of the late uh, Victorian period, that uh, stiff upper lipped aristocrat who, um, who uh, never showed his emotions. He was the exact opposite. He was a throwback to the Regency period um, he was a Regency aristocrat, a romantic figure, who was perfectly happy to wear his heart on his sleeve. Um, he was not a depressive. It's uh, taken for granted for some reason um, that he suffered from what uh, was called black dog depression. He only used the expression black dog once in his whole life, in July 1911, when he was writing to his wife, at a time when the phrase also was used by Victorian matrons to describe their ill-tempered children. Um, he um, did not suffer from a, a chemical imbalance of the kind that gave him depression at, uh, at, cer at uncertain moments, or um, let alone manic depression, or as I've seen in some biographies, bipolar disease. He got depressed, undoubtedly. Uh, he got depressed at the time of the fall of Singapore in February 1942, the fall of Tobruk, in, um, in June 1942, and of course, uh, during the Dardanelles uh, catastrophe that I've told you about. But these are moments, ladies and gentlemen, when any sane person would have got depressed. Um, it didn't mean that he was a depressive, and in fact, he uh, chaired no fewer than a thousand committees of the uh, War Cabinet Defence Committee at all times of day and night, right the way up to three o'clock in the morning. Um, neither was he an alcoholic. He did drink an enormous amount, uh, that's certainly true. Um, he, um, uh, he used to have a glass or two of champagne um, before lunch, a glass or two of white wine in the first, with the first course, glass or two in the second course, and then a glass or two of brandy um, afterwards. And, um, and that was lunchtime, and, and, dinner would be, and dinner would be much the same. And he'd also have what, what his private secretary's called mouthwash, which was some whiskey, a little bit of whiskey and a lot of soda, but would be kept um, solid. It's kept at a, at a level um, all the way through from about six o'clock in the afternoon until he went to bed at three o'clock um, the next morning. Um, but it was only, there were only, he had the most extraordinary iron constitution for alcohol. 
Um, in fact, one of his friends, C.P. Scott, said, uh, said um, Winston Churchill couldn't have been an alcoholic because no alcoholic could have drunk that much. <laughs> um, and um, there's only one occasion on the ho in the whole of the Second World War that um, the, the people around Churchill acknowledged that he was drunk. And, uh, and on that occasion, they had a cabinet meeting. It went on until 3 o'clock in the morning. And um, the next morning, they decided that they were going to re-hold the meeting as though the one the previous night had not taken place. <laughs> and, uh, and so there were no decisions that had been taken as a result uh, in the war of his, uh, of his drinking. Uh, which, considering there, were, um, there are uh, uh, 2,194 days of the Second World War, I find it extraordinary that, uh, that he did only get drunk once, considering the, uh, the enormous pressures and, uh, and stress that he was under. Um, he had a, um, a sad childhood in that his uh, parents, Lord Randolph Churchill, his father, a uh, brilliant, mercurial, uh, disdainful, successful man, Lord Ch he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, a very successful Tory politician, and his, um, and his mother, the incredibly beautiful socialite um, American born in Brooklyn, uh, Jenny Jerome really took no interest in him whatsoever. And in fact, the only time his father seems to have taken interest in him, it was to be contemptuous of him. And, uh, and his mother ignored him almost completely. In the uh, first six months of 1884, when uh, Churchill was nine years old, she only saw him for six and a half hours uh, in those six months. And yet he writes of her in My Early Life, his autobiography, that um, she shone for me like the evening star, brilliant, but at a distance. And of his father, um, he, he was entirely counterintuitive. Instead of rebelling against his father, uh, after his father died at um, age 45 in 1895, when Churchill was 20, he sought out his father's friends. He wrote his father's two-volume biography, over a thousand pages. He uh, adopted his father's political stance, his actual physical stance of speaking. Um, he named his own son Randolph. And, uh, and so he did the exact opposite of what one might, uh, might have, effect, have, have um, assumed. He, um, he was broke almost all his life. Uh, Churchill didn't get into the black until he was in his early 70s when he um, signed the contract for his Second World War memoirs. Up until that point, he, uh, partly because his parents were great spendthrifts, uh, but also because he spent enormously as well. At one point in the 1930s, he had 14 servants. Um, and um, and he, he could hardly ever afford it. So what he did was to, he didn't believe in cutting back. There was one moment where he write, write, wrote to his wife Clementine saying, no more champagne. Mm -hmm. Mary Soames, uh, his daughter, told me that that lasted three days. <laughs> um, but instead, he believed in working harder and earning more. And uh, he did this by writing 37 books and 890 articles. And what he would do, the 37 books are sublime. They, they bear rereading today. Some of them are uh, amongst the, of course, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953, um, partly for his wonderful um, autobiography, My Early Life, but also for uh, other books that they, that they enumerate. Um, and in the articles, what he would do is to, uh, to put an article aside, if an editor didn't want it, he would just put it aside and wait until better days came and um, try to sell it um, at a different time. He would write on absolutely any subject under the sun. Um, and so you get the extraordinary situation, and of course in the Second World War, when editors were very happy to publish whatever the Prime Minister sent them, what he did was to um, recycle old stuff that had been turned down in the 1930s. Uh, and so you get this extraordinary situation in the July of um, 1944, when the, uh, sorry, 1942, when he had a um, uh, terrible time for, for the war effort, by the way. We had, um, uh, the Japanese had taken one eighth of the planet. Um, the Russians were on the retreat um, in, uh, through Ukraine. We were on the retreat through the, um, on the uh, North African littoral. And this was the time that Winston Churchill decided to publish, an, a, 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 as Prime Minister, publish an article in the Sunday Dispatch entitled 
are there men on the moon? Uh, and, uh, and he concluded there probably were, uh, and there, and there were almost certainly UFOs and, and aliens. Um, again, were Theresa May to publish an article like that, we'd all slightly wonder. Um, how was it that Churchill was able to be the first Prime Minister, uh, sorry, the first major politician, um, the first, and for much of the 1930s, really the only leading British politician to warn against Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, and to go further and to say we needed to rearm, especially in the, um, in the air. Um, what, did he, what, what was the special thing that he uh, that enabled him to see um, so far ahead as to uh, be able to spot, um, to spot the innate evil of, uh, of Hitler and the Nazis? One of the things was that he was a philo -Semite. He liked Jews, he had grown up with Jews, his father had liked Jews, he had represented Jews in his first constituency, he, had, he was a Zionist who had um, been in favour of the Balfour Declaration. So he had an early warning system when it came to Hitler and the Nazis to see what, uh, what these people were really like, and one that was not vouchsafed to many of the people on his benches of his age and class and background who were frankly anti-Semitic. That was the first thing. Second thing is that he was an historian. He was able to place Adolf Hitler in the long panoply of threats to the balance of power in Europe. He could see these, uh, an attempt to take hegemony in um, continental Europe, and he placed it in the long, um, long history that uh, went from Philip II of Spain, the time of the Spanish Armada, uh, Louis XIV uh, of France, and the wars of Spanish succession. Of course, it had been his own great ancestor, the uh, first Duke of Marlborough, who had, who had stopped Louis XIV. Uh, in that war, and then on to Napoleon, who he admired greatly, especially for his sense of destiny and his ambition, um, but also appreciated that uh, Napoleon had to be beaten as well. And then the Kaiser, who he had fought against himself, and, uh, and finally Adolf Hitler. So he was able to see this in the, uh, as part of the long tradition of British foreign policy, not to allow any um, European power to uh, hegemonize the continent. And then also, he was somebody who saw, especially in his early uh, years, fighting on the northwest frontier and the um, and the uh, in the Sudan, uh, when he was fighting against religious fundamentalism uh, and fanatics politically with the uh, with the Nazis. And this was something again that was not um, uh, not echoed by the prime ministers of the 1930s, like um, people like. Um, Ramsay MacDonald and Stanley Baldwin and Neville Chamberlain, who had never really come up against fanaticism before at all in their lives. So you have this man, therefore, who makes mistakes but learns from them, who has tremendous physical courage. Uh, during the war itself, he travelled 110,000 miles, uh, an extraordinarily uh, long distance, by plane and by uh, ship. He was, um, in the, the planes were, um, were very much, very often, within the radius of the Luftwaffe. They were unpressurized. He was in his 70s. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was tough stuff. And on one occasion, his plane got struck by lightning coming back from the United States over the Atlantic, which, if the instrumentation had gone down, would have been a curtains for him. Um, he was therefore, because of this 110,000 miles that he cut, that he, um, uh, traveled, he was the glue that kept the big three together. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, obviously, profoundly disabled, although he did make three of the uh, great conferences um, uh, overseas. He, um, Stalin didn't like flying at all and only went to one conference um, outside the Soviet Union during the war. So it was Churchill who went constantly to Moscow and to Washington and so on. Keeping these, uh, keeping the big, big three uh, together and united, it was um, a, a great act of physical courage. Just as when he went up during the Blitz, went up onto the air ministry roof to watch the Blitz, um, and he was constantly attempting to get as close to possible as the as he could to the fighting on various uh, on various fronts. Um, he very, very much wanted to kill a German, 
in the Second World War, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. Uh, he always kept a Bryn gun in the back of his car wherever he was going. Um, he had a machine gun attached to, the, to his lifeboat when he crossed the Atlantic in case his ship was, was sunk by a U-boat, he would then be able to fire on the U-boat. Um, <laughs> And uh, there's a marvellous uh, document in the, in the um, Churchill archives of the speech that he was going to give if the Germans landed, Operation Cromwell it was going to be called, in 1940, um, when uh, the Ministry of Information had given him this speech. And he never once allowed anybody to, uh, to, make, uh, to write his own speeches. He dictated every single one of his own speeches. He had no speech writers, no spin doctors, no... I don't know, focus groups took no notice of opinion polls. If somebody, if Winston Churchill said something, you knew it came straight from him. And so he scribbled, he scribbled out everything that the Ministry of Information had wanted him to say, and instead said, uh, and this was only going to be broadcast if the Germans invaded, and what he was going to say was, the time has come, kill the Hun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, what he also needed, of course, especially in the 1930s, and by the way, of course, his foresight was not, uh, was not confined to just, the, um, uh, just the, before the Second World War. Also, before the First World War, he spotted um, Prussian militarism to be a danger, and in the, after the Second World War, he was also the first man uh, in the West to, uh, to warn um, in his great Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri in March 1946 about the uh, dangers posed by Soviet uh, and Stalinist uh, imperialism, especially in Western, sorry, in Eastern Europe. So, uh, so he had this foresight, and, but what he also needed, the last sort of bit of the jigsaw puzzle, as it were, um, was um, eloquence. And here, Churchill put a lifetime, and I mentioned earlier about all his, prep all his life being in preparation for this hour and for this trial. His eloquence was precisely that. He spoke, uh, he gave 8,000, his, his collected works of speeches cover eight volumes, uh, each of a thousand pages long. And he um, gave hundreds upon hundreds of political speeches up and down the country to the point that he was able to gauge audiences brilliantly. And he was able also to hone phrases. He read Macaulay, he read Gibbon, he was a great lover of Shakespeare, was able to quote huge reams of, of Shakespeare. Um, and so he was able to create phrases that will live for as long as our tongue uh, survives. And what um, he, uh, he used to tell his private secretary, his sort of tricks of the trade, as it were, there were, there were four of them. Um, with regard to these great wartime speeches in which he, uh, in which he fought against demoralization and tried to boost the morale of the nation. And, um, and so he told his private secretary that it was important, firstly, to um, use short words. Secondly, use short sentences. Thirdly, use sentences that have total clarity. And fourthly, if possible, use words that come from the Anglo-Saxon or Old English so that the English-speaking peoples could understand them because they've been using them in common parlance for a thousand years. And so what you see in the final paragraph, the peroration of his great June 1940 speech, um, the, the beginning of the peroration of which is, we shall fight on the beaches, speaking about what was going to happen if the Germans landed. They were going to fight on the beaches, they were going to fight in the landing grounds, they were going to fight in the hills and the streets. Um, it also mentions how they were going to fight with great confidence in the air and uh, ends, of course, we shall never surrender. And, uh, and if you look at that 141 words, all but two of them come from Old English. The exceptions being um, confidence, which comes from the Latin, and surrender, which comes from the French. <laughs> so, um, you asked an Englishman here. Uh, so, to sum up, you have a man who made mistakes, terrible mistakes, appalling um, uh, errors, ones that would probably knock you out of politics altogether today. But, um, he learned from them. Then, you have somebody with extraordinary 